Hello, everyone, and welcome to our online policy dialogue today on crafting a new strategy to revitalize transatlantic relations, relations that, let's say, have been rather traumatized uh, for the last four years. I'm Shada Islam. I'm senior advisor at the European Policy Center. The European Policy Center is organizing this event in cooperation with the Harvard Kennedy School and the German Council on Foreign Relations. Now, friends, you have heard America is back. Uh, and physically, for sure, that is happening. Joe Biden, the US president, was guest of honor at the virtual EU summit last month. Uh, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin have been in town in Brussels talking to the EU and NATO about Russia and Ukraine, Iran, and also, of course, China. It was Blinken's second visit to the EU in a couple of weeks, I think three or four weeks. Uh, so yes, America is back. America is back in town. Visits are good. Slogans are important. But what's the reality of America is back? What does it actually mean for the European Union, which is engaged in its own quest for strategic autonomy? What does it mean for transatlantic relations? And what does it mean for a very different and changed world over the last four years? So we'll be discussing these issues and more over the next 60 minutes with five excellent panelists. I'll introduce them in a minute. And we'll be drawing on the findings of a new report based on a year long reflection by a strategy group, including experts and former government officials convened by the Harvard Kennedy School and the German Council on Foreign Relations. So joining us today are Anthony Gardner, former US ambassador to the European Union and a member of the strategy group and author of the reports uh, section on trade and technology. Tony, thank you very much for joining us for this conversation. Also joining us from Brussels is Sabine Weyand. Introducing you is not a problem. Director General for DG Trade European Commission. Sabine, welcome as well. So Anthony and Sabine will kick off seven minutes each talking about the trade aspects of this transatlantic relationship. And once they've spoken, we will get reactions and comments from Daniela Schwarzer, Director German Council on Foreign Relations, Daniela. Nice to see you again. Uh, Nick Burns, Nicholas Burns, Goodman Family Professor of the Practice of Diplomacy and International Relations. Quite a mouthful there, Nick. Um, Faculty Chair, Project on Europe and Transatlantic Relationship, Harvard Kennedy School. Thank you for joining us. And last but definitely not least, my colleague Yanis Imanulidis, Director of Studies at EPC. Some rules of engagement, some housekeeping. So my conversation with the panelists will last for about 40 minutes or so. And then we will take questions from all of you joining us from across the world, the US, Europe, and beyond uh, in the q and box. My plea, please keep those questions short and to the point so that I can actually get through them and get responses from our wonderful panelists. So um, with that, let me kick off. Uh, let me kick off by giving the floor to Tony. Tony, so you've authored the part of the report on trade and technology and crucial elements, core elements almost in this transatlantic relationship. So your views on how we can converge and how we do in fact have some differences even in this area. Tony, screen's yours. Thank you so much. Hopefully you can hear me. I'm delighted to be part of this very distinguished group and to have participated in the report and to be reunited virtually, at least with Sabine. Um, look, I, I think the, uh, the acid test of the transatlantic relationship will be the extent to which the US and the EU can cooperate on China, including on tech and on trade. And that will certainly be the expectation of many in Congress what good are allies, uh, particularly European allies, if they don't align with us on China? I think that's going to be the question. If we're going to achieve alignment or at least reduce disalignment on the core issues related to China uh, trade and tech, then for goodness sakes, let's clean up the wreckage from the past between us and try to wipe the slate clean. So far, progress has been good. That's my main message here. The EU white paper on transatlantic relations was beautifully aligned with the thinking uh, of the incoming Biden administration. On trade, good progress, you know, agreement to suspend tariffs for four months on Boeing Airbus, a real desire of both sides to get to a deal. Maybe Sabine will give us some more details on where that's going. Agreement on the new uh, director general for the WTO. 
And real progress, uh, as we recommended in the report, to re-engage the OECD uh, on a global deal on taxation. Significant progress on both of those pillars, pillar two on a global minimum tax rate and pillar one on taxation of global digital giants. And this ties in very much with what we're trying to do domestically. One reason why the Biden administration is pushing this is a desire to raise the US headline corporate tax rate to 28% and a desire to achieve a global minimum global tax rate of 21%. Um, now, whether or not we, we get that, you know, as anyone's guess is gonna be pushed back, I assume from some countries, uh, we know who they are, but I think the two things are, have to go hand in hand and there's gonna be a lot of pressure to get something done and we, should, we need to get something done. Uh, also on that pillar one, the digital tax rules, allowing countries to tax digital giants where they make sales even without a physical presence. Uh, and I think this is really important because there is public anger at foreign multinationals that have a large presence in host markets and pay little or no tax. Now, um, so th that's the good news. There are this friction clearly uh, about the investment deal that you signed with China. I happen to think it's been overdone in the press. That's just my view. Uh, it would have been nice to get a bit of uh, opportunity for the incoming team to consult on it. I think yes, but I understand why it was signed in December. Um, but interestingly or ironically, now that deal seems to be on ice uh, in the European Parliament for reasons we all know. There is friction about carbon border adjustment mechanisms. Our report urged the US and the EU to coordinate approaches uh, on a WTO compliant uh, border adjustment mechanism for carbon. I'd like us to be the vanguard of a carbon club. Now, uh, you know, we, we know what John Kerry has said, that it should be a last resort. Um, I, we've all seen what Franz Timmermans has said as well. This is going to move ahead. The European Parliament has just issued a report on this. We're going to have differences on this, no doubt about it. But I hope this is not a serious area of friction. Public procurement is going to be an area of friction, no doubt about it, uh, especially now as we're launching the infrastructure plan. Uh, and the president's been clear that money should be spent on American workers and American companies. But we do have our WTO GPA commitments to respect. But look, I wanted to focus in the last few minutes here on the future agenda, because I think there is a real broad and deep agenda. The president's been clear. He says, I'm not going to enter into any new trade agreement with anybody until we have made major investments here at home and in our workers and in education. And I hope everyone on this call understands, you know, the, the motivations for that statement are completely understandable. But nonetheless, there's a lot that we can, we can do. We can save the dispute settlement body, the WTO. I'd like the United States to lift the aluminum and steel tariffs, as we said in the report. There are domestic political considerations here clearly about how quickly we can do it. I'd like us, as we say in the report, to eliminate tariffs on industrial goods trade. And yes, it has to be accompanied by some movement on agriculture, particularly the sanitary and phytosanitary provisions. I think that we can do some important work on extending the important deal that we did on pharmaceutical mutual recognition agreements and on non-safety auto uh, regulations uh, as well, which we looked at in TTIP with some degree of success. Uh, and I'd like us to work together on WTO reform, especially with regard to Chinese abusive trade and investment practices. We need to continue working with Japan on, uh, on industrial subsidies. I'd like us even to restart the EGA, Environmental Goods Agreement, this is plurilateral agreement to eliminate tariffs on, on green goods. And we need to continue working on eliminating fossil fuel subsidies because green agenda is the top of uh, our respective agendas. And there's a lot of work we need to do as well on uh, aligning our policies on supply chain resilience and diversification, particularly as we have discovered our reliance not only on, on medical supplies, but also on rare earth materials uh, and, and other important inputs. Uh, and, and more broadly, we need to work together on what does a worker-centric trade policy actually mean? Well, it means enforcement, uh, and the EU is now a, a, a person uh, full-time looking at enforcement. Uh, we need to ensure our trade partners respect high standards on labor and environment and IP. And we need above all to work together on what does trade adjustment assistance really mean? How can it work? And finally, Shada, here I'll, I'll come to a close. The Trade and Tech Council is gonna be really crucial. Uh, the, the winds uh, are blowing and are changing in the United States. And for anyone who doubts that, look at what um, you know, Tim Wu uh, at the NEC and Linda Kahn at the FTC is signs of the change that is coming. 
And uh, we need to work on many fronts here in this Trade and Tech Council, but particularly on the challenge of asymmetry. The tech companies know much more about uh, people's lives than they do themselves or citizens and lawmakers. Platforms should tell users and the public what their policies are and how they're enforced. There needs to be more accountability, independent oversight. We need to work together curbing hate speech and terrorist content. We need to work on electoral integrity. We need to work on ethical AI where the EU has been ahead of us. We need to work on um, algorithm, algorithms, uh, make sure they're, they're more explainable. Um, the EU has been very clear on this and the, C, the, the, the EU and the UK have said that the majority of algorithms used by private firms online are currently subject to little or no regulatory oversight. Uh, we need to work on deceptive practices like deep fakes online. Uh, and uh, here I'll, I'll, I'll end, you know, the DSA and DMA asked some very important questions. Uh, the EU is in front of us. Uh, we've lost four years under Trump, but we need to uh, either align or reduce a disalignment on the core issues posed in those two respective pieces of legislation. So big, broad agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. It's indeed big and broad, some areas of alignment, but actually thanks for being very honest also about the areas of discord. And just to quote you from your report, um, when you talked about China, what you do say is Europe will not want to choose between the US and China as the latter will remain a key partner in some areas, including climate change, and as a critical export market for some member states. So let me segue then to Sabine, uh, kicking off with that. Obviously, uproar, outrage last year and early this year over the uh, comprehensive agreement on investments. Uh, but that's not the only thing we should be talking about. I mean, Tony's uh, drawn for us a broad agenda. And I'd like you to sort of zero in on some of the priorities that we as Europeans can actually work uh, hand in hand with the Americans on a global stage uh, as well. Thanks, Sabine. Screen's yours. Thank you very much, uh, Shada, and thank you, uh, Tony, for setting us off on a very constructive uh, uh, course. And I very much appreciated uh, reading the report, also against the backdrop of the uh, EU-US uh, uh, communication that the Commission had put forward in December, and to which Tony referred. I think there is a lot of commonality, uh, but I think we should also, indeed, as Tony also did, not shy away from recognizing that we are not fully aligned and our uh, interests are not necessarily identical. And we have to factor that in, in, in our cooperation. Um, but let me also uh, place this debate against the backdrop of the just adopted uh, review of our trade policy strategy, which is based on three key principles, openness, sustainability, assertiveness. And these principles will also shape our engagement uh, with our key partner, uh, the US because the US remains our key trade and investment partner. Yes, if we look at, at goods, they have been overtaken by China, but if we throw in services and investment, it is quite clear that the transatlantic relationship remains the artery of the world economy. So um, I wanted to zoom in on five areas where we uh, see uh, uh, a need and have the strong wish to work with the US. And they have some overlap with what Tony said, fortunately, uh, but the order is also not exactly the same. And I will stick to the order in which I had noted them down for me. And I think it will be interesting to see that we are coming to the same issues, but maybe from a slightly different angle. Well, first of all, let me recognize we also face on both sides, similar international and domestic challenges. Uh, I think there is, uh, uh, I mean, the geopolitical tensions, uh, the the geoeconomic tensions, the weaponization of trade that we have seen in the last years, mainly embodied by the US-China confrontation, but not only, that is there, and that is something we have to grapple with, uh, but also the disenchantment with globalization that we have domestically, uh, I think is also uh, very present on both sides of the Atlantic. And this idea of a foreign policy for the middle class or a trade policy that works for workers and ordinary people is something that resonates very much in, in Europe as well. So from that point of view, I think we are, we are starting from a similar reading of the international situation. So where do we see the big opportunities for engagement? The first priority is we want to work to deliver on the reform of the WTO. 
And for that, the partnership between the US and the EU is indispensable. It's not sufficient, but it is in indispensable. Without an agreement between the two of us, I don't think we will be able to move that forward. And uh, uh, I know concerns on, for instance, the dispute settlement are bipartisan in the US. We think we, we, we can work on a solution to that. We've been leaning very much forward in the WTO annex of our trade strategy to recognize uh, the concerns expressed by, by the US. But of course, this whole issue of WTO reform goes much further. It's about showing the relevance of the WTO for rule setting in today's globalized world. And that means we have to work urgently on issues like trade and health, or we have to work urgently on trade and environment and notably trade and climate. Now, of course we have, and that's the second priority in a way, the whole issue of the level playing field in the global economy. And that's why I come to China. And of course, the level playing field I mentioned will be a key factor uh, in our WTO reform proposals. And here we can build on the trilateral work, which we are impatient to pick up again uh, now with the new administration, working on subsidies, on uh, IP, uh, uh, on uh, um, state-owned enterprises, uh, etc. But we should also coordinate between the EU and the US on the use of our autonomous instruments because I think that is necessary as an incentive to other partners to agree to the updating of the rule book. So that would be the first two priorities, the WTO and the level playing field, notably with respect uh, to, uh, to China. Third priority is to uh, work together to shape global rules on technology and trade um, to, to respond uh, to what we are living now, the challenges of digital transition, artificial intelligence, um, uh, who is setting the standards for the future. These standards are also linked to our democratic values. Will it be democratic, liberal democracies uh, uh, setting these standards for the future or will they be uh, set by autocratic regimes? I think here again, we have uh, 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 the need to work together uh, we've started working together on 5G, on all these issues. So we are keen to have the Trade and Technology Council take off as the umbrella under which to work together on all these issues. Fourth priority is to uh, weigh in together on issues like climate change and to, uh, to coordinate indeed our efforts uh, to limit carbon leakage. Now, obviously the US has some catching up to do uh, we are quite advanced in setting out our internal uh, framework in order to reach the very ambitious targets we have set ourselves. The US government is now back in Paris and very uh, engaged on the international scene, and we are extremely happy about that. But of course, they have to still set their objectives in terms of emission reductions, and they still have to work out their domestic policies. So we will have to, to work in a way crabwise. Uh, we, cannot, we cannot on the EU side afford to step back. Uh, we are on a track where we have to deliver legislation because otherwise we will not be able uh, uh, to reach the targets we have set for ourselves. And that has consequences. But we need to work together on CBAM because the objective of CBAM is not to impose tariffs on other people. The objective of CBAM is to raise the level of global ambition in combating climate change. And that's something where we would be very happy to work together with the, with the US. And the fifth point is indeed to ensure that trade works for all citizens and to uh, explore initiatives on trade and labor. I think that is something where uh, in certain issues, uh, on certain aspects, the US is more advanced uh, uh, than the EU. We, are, uh, uh, we have taken traditionally a different approach in our trade and sustainable development chapters uh, in free trade agreements, but we have a very good track record of working with the ILO. Uh, so I think there is a mutual learning uh, uh, process that, that can uh, come in this respect. Now, um, Tony said that the asset test for the relationship will be how aligned we are on China. Well, let's not set ourselves up for disappointment here because our interests are not exactly the same. There is a huge overlap. I think we have a large interest in making sure that China uh, plays by international rules, that we have a level playing field, etc. We are not interested, uh, we do not think that, we're not interested in a full decoupling from China. We don't think that's realistic. China is a, a, a country 
the size of which obliges us to work with them when there has to be engagement on the base of rule on the basis of rules. There also has to be assertive action through autonomous instrument, and we are uh, 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 we are working on that as well. You mentioned uh, Kai, uh, where we always said this is one plank of our policy. Um, it's, it's part of the rules-based engagement with China, but we also always said that ratification does not take place in an uh, in a political vacuum, and obviously after the Chinese reaction. Uh, to the sanctions that uh, were taken by the EU and others uh, in relation to uh, Xinjiang, prospects are not there to move forward now uh, with uh, with this agreement. So we'll have to see. But I mean, we will have to see. We are not interested in a full decoupling, but we are interested in being able to avoid a dependency uh, on uh, uh, on China, whether that is on technology or anything else. Uh, but uh, 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 it is uh, the alignment with China uh, will not be 100% because obviously our engagement, our exposure uh, to the Chinese economy uh, is, is, uh, is different. But uh, there is still a large overlap of areas where we can and should work better together. For me, the asset test actually is of the relationship is actually, are we able to put aside our divergencies and our conflicts? Um, Tony mentioned uh, Airbus Boeing, so it's good that we started uh, with the suspension for four months. Uh, we are very keen to now get into the real settlement of the issue, we, because, which is not without its complications. We need to find an agreement on uh, continuing measures uh, and we need to, on existing measures, and we need to set, more importantly, disciplines for the future, which then others can also join up to, including China. So that is what we need to work on. Four months is very, very short. The administration is still in the process of reviewing policy. So we are keen to see what they will actually bring us as ideas to the table. 232 is very complicated. I'm very worried that here we are running out of time. Uh, we had suggested, or we are suggesting still that we would also suspend tariffs uh, for a period of six months in order to give us time to sort out the issues. Um, because, of course, for us, it is not acceptable to be treated as a security threat by an ally. And that sits oddly now with an administration which has gone out of its way to underline how much they see Europe as an ally and the way they've been engaging with Europe as an ally in, in many areas. So uh, what I'm worried about is, though, that we are on an automatic track to have the second tranche uh, of our rebalancing measures come into force 1st of June. Um, and uh, we really need to find a solution before that, and a solution which puts us on a path towards addressing the root causes of the problems we are seeing here. Um, and that is not uh, EU exports uh, of steel and aluminium to the, to the US, but it is China's overcapacity. So we need to find a way uh, uh, to deal with these issues. Um, then uh, uh, we also have uh, uh, the question of the US Section uh, 301 unilateral measures, uh, which remain a concern, although we are very encouraged by uh, uh, Secretary Yellen's uh, pronunciations on, um, uh, on how she sees uh, the whole discussion about uh, global, global taxation. So we, we see there is uh, an opportunity here. Uh, to basically uh, reduce uh, uh, that conflict. Um, but that still leaves us uh, with the, our preoccupation about the Buy American policy. Um, and I think here we will have to discuss uh, with the US administration. Indeed, uh, we are very concerned about the US uh, uh, walking away from its GPA commitments, but more generally, uh, we think that we have an interest in building resilient supply chains and that um, basically reserving uh, public procurement for local companies um, can reduce our resilience in the situation in which we are, increase costs also for local companies who have to rely on international supply chains. So from that point of view, a lot to discuss. And I think for me, the asset test will be are we able to manage our divergency so that we can free ourselves and put our political energy into building the strong transatlantic foundation for a global governance that is uh, fairer and more sustainable? Thank you.
Thank you very much, Sabine, as well, for a very frank and honest response to what Tony has said. And uh, the acid test, you say, Tony, is China, and Sabine says it's managing our divergences. And I do have a question for both of you that I'd like you to think about while I turn to the other panelists, and that's really about the global stage and the current pandemic and the question of vaccines. And as you know, the WTO Director General has just had a conversation on vaccine equity. Um, and uh, there, are, there are calls for waivers on international protection for vaccine production, et cetera. Very important global issue uh, for our world as it comes out of this pandemic, hopefully. So I'd like you to think about that while I turn to the other uh, panelists for some of their comments on what you both uh, sketched out as being a, a very, very important laundry list of questions that have to be tackled. But where do you think, Daniela, we should be putting our energies and our effort in the next few months to try and sort out this very, uh, this mosaic that's out there, this puzzle that's about uh, transatlantic uh, relations when it comes to trade and perhaps also the broader, the broader uh, stage as well? Because it's not just trade. We also talk about Iran, we talk about Russia, Ukraine, all kinds of different issues as well. So, Daniela, screen's yours. Thank you very much, Father, uh, for this question, but most of all for chairing our discussion today. And I do wish to use my first minute to thank EPC, but also Tony and Sabina for joining in, in our discussion on the Transatlantic Report, which uh, we published together um, with Harvard um, Kennedy School few months ago already, but as our debate today shows, um, there's a lot of substance to chew on, and I'm glad we can have this discussion today. Um, I think, you know, laundry list is, is not really the right name, in my view, because it's such an important list of very concrete priorities, and I, I wouldn't be able to pick and choose and say one is more important than the other, because what the two previous speakers have given us is really both um, an analysis of the joint of the geopolitical challenges Europe and the US are facing. And I would fully agree uh, with Tony Gardner, if we do not manage to build a trustful and comprehensive uh, way to work on China together, uh, the transatlantic partners will not be able to achieve a lot. And um, this has a trade dimension, it has a tech dimension, it has a deep value and democracy dimension because we are in the midst of a, of a time of systemic competition and we can feel it within our countries, we can feel it in our neighborhood and we can see it playing out day by day in a region which has gained strategic importance also from the European perspective, which is the Indo-Pacific. So if I just look back at the last um, say four, five months, um, just at the European debate, how we have changed our perspectives and those changes are not entirely new, but I think there is a lot of acceleration um, due to the pandemic, which you also very rightly mentioned. And today I think we are in a more advanced state of thinking uh, in the European Union. Hopefully soon I would say Europe, including the UK, where we have a big task to build a joint and close approach thinking about all of those issues. Um, and our perceptions and our analysis of uh, the risks and, and threats around us, I think have changed a lot in Europe. Um, if we look at uh, the way the China debate has changed, if we look at the new attention that is now being paid to the question, which is a transatlantic issue at heart, how to, uh, how to strengthen multilateralism going forward. If we look at this need to develop a European Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, where China is obviously the ele elephant in the room, I think the European agenda as such is, is very, very full. Um, and none of those issues can meaningfully be tackled uh, unless we also add a transatlantic dimension to this discussion. Now, the thing that, that worries me um, a lot is of course the question of whether the European Union, despite the progress that I've just described in terms of strategic debate and, and also positioning, whether the European member states will be ready not only to debate and analyze, but also to act. Um, and here, I think the, the link to the American debate is, is so important for us to consider which is on the domestic determinants of our foreign policy going forward. 
because we are now entering in Europe, we are entering a uh, election period uh, in the two major EU member states, Germany going for general elections in September and France not only preparing its EU presidency uh, for the first half of 2022, but also preparing its presidential and parliamentary elections. And so I think bringing those discussions home and being able to argue where the benefit not only the material benefit in terms of transatlantic cooperation and deep European cooperation on these issues lies is one priority, but then also the reaffirmation of our shared value base. Um, and it's not by a co coincidence that our report actually starts with the first chapter, which is about democracy um, and uh, liberal democracy and Western values that the transatlantic relationship in our view, should be based upon. But also, uh, this is a, a truly inner European debate. Um, and we are in the midst of it with the way we look at Hungary and Poland. Um, and we haven't found a strong enough position within Europe. But what we need is a very thorough debate uh, between the US and Europe, how we can help each other maybe uh, tackle our domestic problems in that regard, but also reach out to the world in a very clear understanding that this makes us a true, true values community. I um, can only be short and I will close with one thought. If I had to define a theme uh, for the next month to come for the European, but also the transatlantic agenda against that backdrop, I think we need to find ways to protect that openness which we cherish and which we need to strengthen because if we don't um, and we are too unprotective of this big value that we have, we may very well slide into a period of um, nationalism, of reaffirmation of borders within the EU and a growing incapacity to take a broader geopolitical view and to cooperate. Thank mm. you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Daniela. So talking about a values community, the concerns about and the fear of nationalism, protecting our openness, but also I think what Sabine had said about uh, setting the standards for the future. Uh, I think this is also something that we need to talk about when you talk about value, especially when it comes to the digital sphere, obviously. So thank you very much for that. Nick, if I could turn to you for your three and a half minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shada. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. I first wanted to thank the German Council on Foreign Relations and Dan Daniela Schwarzer for being a great partner for Harvard Kennedy School on this year-long report that we issued, Stronger Together. You can find it, a link to it in the chat. Um, I want to also thank Catherine Kluver, Ashbrook, Tori Tausig, my colleagues at Harvard for being uh, such an instrumental part of this. Shada, three points in three minutes. First, it's obvious we're seeing a dramatic and positive revival in the strategic relationship between Europe and the US. And we Americans wanted that after the last four years. We're seeing that President Biden has been more in touch with the European leadership, I think, in three months than Donald Trump was, at least in a positive vein, in four years. Uh, Tony Blinken, our Secretary of State, just made his second trip to Europe in two and a half months. He was in Brussels for three days this week. Um, it's important to remind ourselves as Americans, Europe's our largest trade partner. Europe's our largest investor. We have a critical relationship with the European Union and, and that relationship, I think Sabine is in better shape certainly than it was before. And finally, in this vein, on this first point, um, as we have now, um, as President Biden and Jens Stoltenberg have effectively announced the end of our two decade mission in Afghanistan, we have to pay tribute uh, to Europe and to the NATO alliance. I was ambassador to NATO on 9-11. And when we went into Afghanistan, Europeans and Americans together, and uh, we thank Europe for the thousands of sol tens of thousands of soldiers who've been there, the more than 1,000 soldiers who've died, European soldiers, the several thousand European soldiers wounded uh, and the two decades of alliance effort, NATO has performed spectacularly well. And it's because Europe's been a great partner for the United States. So first point, this relationship, I think, is back on track. Second point, but inevitably we have challenges. What are they? First on climate, and I agree with Sabina, um, you're seeing a major effort by the United States. No American administration has ever taken the positions 
the ambitions in the reduction of our carbon emissions uh, that Joe Biden has taken, the appointment of John Kerry, very important. We're already working well together. We have to push Japan on coal. We have to push China and India on further uh, emissions reductions. Certainly, we look to Europe as our key partner. I think that's going very well. Russia, of course, a major concern this week with um, more than uh, 10,000 Russian troops right on the Ukrainian border. I thought it was effective for our Secretary of State and Defense to be with European colleagues, effectively warning the Russians about what would happen in terms of the economic consequences, the sanctions consequences, uh, should the Russians go into Ukraine again. Um, in this vein, I would say very respectfully, and we wrestled with this issue in our report, Germany should suspend the Nord Stream 2 effort. It entirely favors Russia and it penalizes Ukraine. It's a major mistake by the German government and other authorities, and I think that should happen. Um, on the positive side of this, the US announced an increase in the American troop commitments uh, at, uh, in Germany, and that is important to deter Russia. Final point, Shada, on China. This is gonna be the major test, I think, of the US-Europe relationship. We need a stronger, more unified American, European, and I would say Japanese uh, effort to limit China and to compete with China. Uh, the US is looking first to its allies in East Asia. Prime Minister Suga is arriving in Washington today. He's the first visitor to see uh, Joe Biden uh, in the White House. Um, we're seeing from the Quad countries, Japan, India, Australia, a perfect synchronization of the efforts uh, with the United States. We're not seeing that with Europe. And Sabina, I would very respectfully disagree that our interests are not aligned. There is no one in the Biden administration and very few people in Congress talking about some kind of decoupling of the American economy with uh, China's economy. We are talking about competition. So the questions are, will Europe we be with the United States, with Australia, with Japan, with India, that we've got to call China, uh, call out China and work against China's violation of its WTO commitments. Will Europe be with us in castigating the Chinese for, our hum for its human rights transgressions in Xinjiang province, in Hong Kong, and its threats and intimidation of Taiwan? Um, I think in this respect, I would say respectfully, the EU-China investment agreement was a tactical mistake by the Europeans. You should have waited for the Biden administration. We have to work together. We can't allow the Chinese to divide us and you allowed that to happen. And I think it was a major tactical mistake. So the challenge here is on 5G and other issues, can we be together? And I think that's where our, our not just our trade ministers, but our heads of government and foreign ministers have to have to do further work. But there's every reason for the United States to want to be working with Europe on this. I think it is the greatest test, however, for China. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, coming back to also the issue of Japan, thank you very much for bringing that uh, country into this conversation as well, because uh, obviously US, EU can't do everything. We need allies, we need to work with friends uh, outside. So thank you for bringing that in. Let me just turn to you, Yanis. So we're talking about competition. There's always this sort of element that competition is somehow a bad thing. Um, I, I just wonder if competition isn't actually constructive and, and can be actually quite positive uh, for geopolitics and international relations, uh, especially if it's done in a, in a positive and constructive manner. And I also wanted to ask you, Yanis, is it fair to reduce the, the strength of this relationship transatlantic to a convergence uh, on China alone. I mean, we've seen, we've had to talk about Iran, Russia, Ukraine, um, the Indo-Pacific. I mean, there's so many questions, climate, all the, is it fair to just bring it down to one, uh, one issue? So screen's yours, Yanis. Thanks, Jada. Um, thanks also for moderating today. I'll also try to concentrate on three main messages like Nick did. Um, but let me first of all say thank you, thanks to all of you, but thanks to the Harvard Kennedy School, thanks to Dig Yappi for choosing to do this event today with the EPC. That's very fortunate from our perspective. So the first point I wanted to make is that um, 
you have done a very good job in putting together your report. And um, also reflecting on what Tony was saying, that there has already been good progress. If you look at the things which have been achieved over the past months, obviously there's a lot still which needs to be done. But the starting point has been positive. The first months have been positive. And a good number of the things which you mentioned in your report have actually either been implemented or is the process of being implemented. But as we all know, there's a lot which still needs to do. And there are a lot of differences to overcome, which you have all highlighted. But I think the biggest challenge which we are facing on both sides of the Atlantic is to make sure that we can keep, create, but also keep the deep relationship across the Atlantic sustainable in the long term. So we already need to think of 24, of 2028 and beyond. And I think in order to get there, that was mentioned both by, by Tony and by Zabina, is we need to convince our citizens, we need to convince our societies of the added value of this relationship, because this is the best way to make the deep relationship across the Atlantic sustainable in the long term. So think of the concrete benefits. Worker-centric trade policy was mentioned by Tony. Sabine was talking about trade policy, which works for people. This is actually what we, what we need to achieve and as fast as possible, we need early successes and that's important for the sustainability of the relationship. Second point that relates to something which uh, Shada, you were asking me. Um, I think that um, the relationship towards China is an asset test. There are many other issues which are high on the agenda, also geopolitical issues. You mentioned some of them, um, Shara, which we need to deal with both in Washington and Brussels. But whether Europeans like it or not, I think the relationship with China will be key for the future also of the transatlantic relationship. Clearly, this is not an easy task, but we are closer between Brussels and DC than we have been for many years. And that is showing itself. And that already is, I think, a major progress. However, we have a fundamental difference across the Atlantic. For the US, this is an existential threat. From the European perspective, we do not want to decouple, as Sabine was saying. We know that this is a complex relationship with China. We know that there is cooperation, but there's also competition and systemic rivalry. Um, but we Europeans want to avoid the advent of a fundamental competition or a fundamental confrontation. So shadow confrontation could also be positive if you use it in a positive way, but when it becomes a fundamental confrontation and a fundamental com competition, which potentially can spear out of control, then it becomes a problem. And here, in case the relationship between the US and China deteriorates, we Europeans will get under pressure because we do not agree among ourselves of how we would deal in a, such a circumstance. So we want to avoid that happening. And I think we should do our best to avoid an escalation of the relationship. And the last point, and I'm gonna be shorter here, is addressing ourselves. Um, I wanna take up something which Daniela was saying. She was talking about the German and the French elections that this is gonna take a lot of our political energy and also gonna make it difficult on our sides to operate. But I would add to that, that one thing is uh, the COVID-19 crisis. Once we will at some point have gotten over the worst of this crisis, and it will take some time, but once we have gotten over it, I fear that we might have a collective feeling of fatigue. This was such a difficult period. We had to do so many things. We had to overcome so many different dimensions of the crisis that we might run out of steam when it comes to doing things which you still need to do. That's something which I would add to Daniela's um, reflection on the German and French elections. Plus, there is this feeling, and let's not underestimate, that the situation now across the Atlantic has improved because the Biden administration is in place. We got rid of a problem we had for four years. Um, do we really need to do now ABC, which would be a major mistake. So we need to find a way to keep our pressure on the European side to deliver when it comes to the things which we say in Sunday speeches, which often in Monday's realities are not being implemented. So we need to put the pressure on ourselves to make sure that we deliver on what we're promising or what we're saying. And that is also going to be important with respect to the transatlantic relationship. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Janice. Thank you very much. Uh, I've got a number of questions, very interesting questions coming in. So I'm going to go back to Tony and Sabine and obviously uh, all three of you as well, Janice, Nick and, and Daniela, you're welcome to chip in as well. We have 15 minutes. Let me let me start with Rachel. Rachel Esplin Odell from Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft in the US asking about um, what Tony, you referred to as China's abusive trade 
and technology practices. A question is, uh, does the EU view as the main problem areas in China's trade and tech practice? Are there specific abuses that you can agree with the US, Sabina, uh, in need to be combated when it comes to China? And uh, there's a question from Nico Keppens, um, who says, do we have to continue in this competition attitude? The challenges are worldwide, the resources are limited, and wouldn't it be better for citizens and everyone if we set aside our games? Um, question from uh, Jan von Herf. Uh, this is a question for you, Nick. If the US is 100% aligned with the Quad, as you said, uh, it was, what is the story around RCEP uh, versus TPP then? So the two trade uh, arrangements, the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the RCEP, where I think the US is still obviously not ready to go back. Um, uh, this is about from Noah, Noah Barkin from GMF and the Rogium Group, asking a question to Sabine. Uh, the US and Japan are working together on supply chain security for strategic technology components like semiconductors. Can you see the EU joining this effort? Um, and then there's a question about Britain. Um, this is from Jan again, what role to play with the island in the Atlantic, which chose not to be part of the EU experience, um, Brexit and all this, role of the G7, or especially the panel on global economic resilience, which is talking about resilience um, supply chains, and let me just see here. Uh, standards again, uh, the point that uh, Sabine made, this is from Malcolm Harbour, um, about EU-US-EU coordination on standards development, especially in digital and environmental technologies. Um, and let me just see this last one. Yes, also for you, Sabina, from Florian Stauer, uh, which role will 5G and connectivity play in the EU-US Trade and Technology Council? And just let me say, I'd also like you to, oh yes, from, um, let's not miss this, from Ayana from Borderlex. Um, so shouldn't the transatlantic relationship also include the UK? Uh, from Airbus, Boeing to tackling China in the Pacific, uh, we uh, obviously need Britain uh, to be part of the conversation. And I think this is really enough from, uh, from all of our panelists. Thank you very much, all of you participants for those questions. Let's turn back now. Let's start with you, um, uh, Tony, to get some feedback. And then I'll go to Sabine and, and the others in, uh, in the way we did earlier. So, Tony, screen's yours. Well, I, I, I'll just take a few of them. Yes, please. of course, of course, please do. Please, all of you, be selective, yes. So, uh, let me start with Nico's question because it's an interesting question, but let me say I disagree with the premise of it. Um, I think we are in a rivalry and we need to call it for what it is. It's a rivalry of our lifetime and I think it's an existential rivalry. With a, um, with, with a country that has the means and the capacity to pose a fundamental challenge to our values. And I think a lot of people agree with me in the United States and I think also in Europe. And it extends in many, many areas. We mentioned a few today, trade and standards. And standards is something that doesn't get enough attention. Malcolm Harbour is one of the world's experts on this, on this topic. Um, I think it should be a top three issue for our trade and tech council because the Chinese have understood it's not just a question of dominating the, the industries of the future, whether it's robotics or nano and, and, uh, and quantum computing and so on. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's also about writing the rules, writing the rules and dominating the international standard setting organizations worldwide, which they're beginning to do already. They've named five heads of key standard setting organizations because once you do that, you enshrine advantages for your exporters and you basically decide what rules apply to very important things like facial recognition, video surveillance, and autonomous vehicles and things like that. We are in a major rivalry now and we had better cooperate. And that's why I started with the words and I knew this was gonna get a reaction. I used the word acid test. And I, I didn't suggest that that's the way it should be. I'm suggesting that's the way it is. That's the way it's viewed. And uh, I would just caution, we should not set up straw men whether it's decoupling straw man or a straw man that we're asking Europe to join with us in a crusade or you know, ganging up on China, that's not what this is about. This is about our declining influence respectively in a world where others are gaining influence and we had better cooperate on these key issues. Otherwise we're not gonna succeed. 
Now, it doesn't mean that we're going to, you know, uh, find China to be a rival or a competitor on everything. On we mentioned, you know, climate on many areas. Climate is absolutely fundamental, but China is fundamental on other issues as well. Um, but I, I find, uh, you know, I think we should be very clear, clear eyed on this. And RCEP and TPP was mentioned, or CPTPP were, were mentioned. You know, the Chinese understand very well, and this is what's behind RCEP, is that they want to be a major actor in, uh, in world trade rules. And that's why I really regret us walking away from TPP. We're not going to probably rejoin anytime soon, but let's be clear. When we leave a vacuum, others fill it. And that's what's happened. The other 11 moved ahead, stripping out key, key issues, whether it's IP or environment or labor. You know, vacuums, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. So we should be doing what the EU has been doing very successfully, signing up deals around the world and enshrining their values, whether it's on privacy or geographical indications and so forth. We need to engage. So I think that's really what I wanted, uh, just wanted to say, thanks. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, Sabina, we turn to you. Thank you very much. Um, I think this is an opportunity to drill down indeed beyond headline uh, uh, formulations on how we view China. And I think indeed we are on both sides of the Atlantic very much aligned in terms of the analysis of the challenges. What we still need to work through is the alignment on the policy responses to that. And here, traditionally, the EU uh, puts greater store by the ability of rules to discipline behavior. And we will still have to work out with the new administration how much store they are willing to put into rules uh, to deal with China. That was not the case of the previous administration at all. Uh, but I think we are aligned in terms of the analysis of the challenge. And that brings me also to these issues uh, that are very much in the area of technology uh, 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 and the digital transformation, where I think uh, we need to work together, perhaps not even on 5G, where I think we have been aligning, uh, but on 6G, more importantly. I think we really need to make sure that we set the standards of the future, uh, that they are set by liberal democracies that value privacy and uh, 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 human rights. And I think that is what we need to work on, and the Trade and Technology Council will be key for that. Um, now, uh, uh, in this context, we should also look at uh, uh, security of supply chains in critical technological goods like semiconductors. And here I also see an alignment uh, between the review that was launched by the Biden administration into strategic dependencies, vulnerabilities, etc., and the work the, we are currently doing in the Commission, DG Trade and DG Grow. Um, in the context of the industrial policy uh, we are coming forward with, where we are looking at largely the same sectors. And there are issues of dependency, but also reverse dependencies, where China is actually dependent on either the EU or the US or both. And I think we need to factor in both the dependencies and the reverse depend dependencies in order to deal with them and in order to preserve our autonomy to act. Um, and I think that that is what is essential uh, in, uh, in, uh, in this respect. Um, and I also think that actually, Kai, and here I do disagree respectfully with Nick, uh, I do think Kai, the negotiated outcome, has the benefit of providing a platform from which to engage China on issues of excessive subsidization leading to overcapacity, but also the distortions brought through state-owned enterprises. Um, there is a commonality on, for instance, uh, forced technology transfer in both the phase one agreement that the US has and in CHI, uh, which can be a basis on which to engage uh, China in, in rulemaking, which hopefully we can develop trilaterally first with Japan and then bring to a plurilateral agreement uh, uh, in the WTO. But I think there there are, from that point of view, I actually see value in, in using this as a springboard. And of course, we also have to take into account that uh, the uh, US uh, phase one deal unbalanced uh, the playing field in China to the detriment of EU companies. And so that also was an, in, an additional pressure to conclude the negotiations uh, with, uh, with China. Uh, and what we have put forward actually improves the level playing field in China 
not only for EU players, but a lot of the commitments are MFN, so they benefit the US and others. Now, so from that point of view, I think I see here something which we can use as a basis. Um, so uh, uh, that is what I would like to say uh, in this respect. So obviously the same issues are being discussed in different fora, but I think the EU-US angle to this, given our capacity to also move things forward in the WTO globally, for me is an indispensable basis of that. That does not exclude anyone else. And as I said, we have successful examples of trilateral cooperation. Uh, we should build on that. And in any case, um, as I said before, EU-US understanding is indispensable, but it is not sufficient in order to move things forward. So that is how others uh, have to be brought into this as well. And I think I will, I will stop there perfectly aware that I haven't exhausted the questions. <laughs> and, 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 they, and the questions will go on and this conversation needs to continue. But Sabine, just very quickly uh, to both you and Tony, uh, the WTO equity question when it comes to vaccines, I mean, the, it's a big issue about IPR waivers. And that's one where you agree not to do it together, which is, if you like, a kind of negative coming together. But surely for the, for, the, for the health of the world, the global health issue, this is important. And I'm just wondering if you could just very quickly give me an indication of whether your positions are, are stuck in, uh, or will they change, adapt? Do you want me to go first? Just yes, please, Sabine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think we had yesterday a very interesting event. Um, and we now have a WTO director general uh, who has a background in all these issues yeah. uh, with her Gavi experience. And I think by bringing together public authorities and companies yesterday, she has put the finger on where things are being blocked. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we have in the current pandemic suffered from a lack of global cooperation, which has led to uh, 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 countries or entities closing in on themselves. We have, an, at great political cost to ourselves, kept exports flowing of vaccines. We are the biggest exporter of vaccines globally. We have put in place a transparent regime of authorization, and, uh, 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 I, uh, but we have used it in a very responsible manner. We have a lot, I think the first lesson is we need more transparency on the measures that countries are taking. But the most important element that came out of that is we will only be able to deal with a global pandemic if we manage to ramp up uh, global production Absolutely. across the whole supply chain, not just on vaccines. And I think what we have done is we have seen, and I think the US uh, has started that earlier with Operation Warp Speed, to really invest across the whole supply chain. We have now in Europe, uh, we've, we've done the same matchmaking between the suppliers and the vaccine producers, et cetera, to ramp up the production. I think we have to replicate that investment across supply chains at a global level, because that's the only way we are going to, uh, 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 to deal, not only with this pandemic, which will not be over uh, uh, when the Americans or the Europeans uh, are vaccinated, so we really have to invest in that. But we also have to draw the lessons and put in place rules that help us deal with another pandemic. Absolutely. Because we, are, we risk entering an age of, of, of pandemics. And at the moment, we are not equipped for that. This is heavy lifting, but I hope that we can uh, take this forward. And I think the G20 may be a good forum for that, because there we have also China and India at the table and other players. Um, but uh, uh, I think that is where we are. At the same time, we have to recognize the pressure on politicians is just tremendous at the moment. So, you know, it takes a lot of heroism to stand up to that uh, and a lot of uh, uh, foresight not to fall for the short term uh, uh, solution. Mm -hmm. And as I said, uh, we are currently, yes, we get international criticism for the export authorization regime. But um, if you look at the internal debate, a lot of people are not understanding why we are the only ones that uh, kept and keep vaccines flowing. But we are determined to continue doing that. But we are also determined to hold companies uh, to their responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sabina. Uh, I'm very conscious of the time. We've got a minute left. So I, I'll, take a, I'll take about another five minutes to, just to go back to everyone. So Tony, if you want to come in very quickly on this issue. I'll be super brief because I think yeah. Sabina 
terrific, very detailed answer. And we're lucky that she's in, in her current post. Uh, I'll just say this, you know, I, I remember 1995, hate to go back, back in detail uh, so, so far, but in a new transatlantic agenda focused on global pandemics in the future. Uh, and we thought a lot about this. I was, was a young guy in the, in the Clinton uh, team along with Nick. Um, and you know, nothing was done, essentially. Nothing was done for 25 years or more, right? Now it's time to actually do something, make this one of the top three issues of the Trade and Tech Council. I mean, how do we work together on research? How do we work together okay. uh, on, uh, on supply chain diversification, resilience? Uh, how do we uh, even consider the trade aspects of this? Uh, how do we make sure that the stockpiles are there next time this comes around? So it's just disappointing that it's taken so long, but now is, now is crunch time. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll go back very, very quickly now to Daniela, Nick, and Yanis. So starting with you, Daniela, just very quickly, a minute perhaps. Daniela, can you not hear me? Yes, I, I'll very, very quickly yeah. respond to the question whether you the UK should be included in the trans. I can hear you and I'm speaking. Can you not hear me? We hear you. Yes. We hear I'm you. Sorry, I will just come in for one minute on the transatlantic. You're hearing me. Okay. So very briefly on uh, the question whether the UK is part of the transatlantic relationship, of course it is. Uh, and in our report, when we say Europe, we definitely mean uh, the UK and, and other important countries that may not be part of the EU to be part of this relationship. Although we of course appreciate that some of the competencies lie in the hands of the European Commission, in particular in the field of trade, um, the UK has to be part of the strategic alliance across the Atlantic. Um, and I think uh, EU Europeans need to pay a lot of attention uh, to what is ha happening in terms of foreign policy strategy making in London these days. Uh, the G7 was mentioned, an important moment uh, for the British Prime Minister, then the COP26 this, this autumn on climate. Um, and I think there's an agenda to build across uh, the channel, um, but we're not quite there yet. And uh, the UK Prime Minister is developing a very interesting narrative on his country's role in the world. And I would hope we get a unified approach to that across the channel soon. Thank you very much. Nick? Yes, very briefly, Shada. Um, should we include the UK? Absolutely, given the economic power of the United Kingdom and its global view. Uh, second, I think that on the China trade issues, we have to be very careful not to let China divide us. So um, that would mean trying to have the EU, the US, and Japan sometimes speak with the same voice, particularly on trade complaints. On decoupling, I don't recognize that as the policy of either of the Trump or Biden administrations. That's Steve Bannon's policy, the far, far extremist views. No one's talking about decoupling. And so to say that the, EU, the EU can't be with us because we're for decoupling, it's just not true. Now, what we are for is an industrial policy for the first time in many decades in the United States. We are for protecting our supply chains, but you are too. And so I think there's a lot of convergence between the EU and the United States. And final point, um, we're very grateful to the EU and to NATO uh, here in the US for our alliance. And I wanna thank Sabina, Daniela, Yanis, and you, Shada. This has been a very good discussion, too short. Uh, let's follow it up. But I think that the future is very positive for the Europeans and Americans working together. Thank you. Thank you, Yanis. I'll be also very quick. Um, going back to what uh, Nico was asking us, whether we can set aside competition attitudes, set aside power gain. I'm in line with what Tony, what you were saying. There's a reality which tells us that we are a different situation. Um, and the likelihood is that it potentially will not improve as time passes. But there is, as Nick was saying, a convergence between the US and the EU when it comes to China. The question is whether we Europeans will also be able to play the role of a bridge builder uh, between both sides, the US and China. And there, Shada, there's a chance for us here. There's an opportunity for us to play that role. I'm not sure that we will be able to live up to it, but it is an opportunity of a role we can play. Um, however, in order to be able to do that, we need to show commitment, both in our transatlantic relationship, um, but we also need to show 
Yeah, we need to enjoy trust from all sides, which also means that we need to invest in having that trust. And unfortunately, what we saw over the past weeks with the countermeasures of Beijing to the to European sanctions, I think didn't help us to create that trust in order for us to play also the bridge builder role, which I think we should be playing. And I'll just stop and end by saying again, thanks for all of you from the perspective of the EPC for making this event possible and be with us. Thank you indeed. Thank you very much indeed for this conversation. Now, as moderator, I've sort of kept my own views uh, to the side. I haven't come forward with many of my views. Um, but if you want to know what I think about all this, I've written uh, an op-ed with Rachel uh, uh, and Michael Swain at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. It's in the National Interest, came out earlier this week, in which we say together that uh, yes, uh, transatlantic relations are back on track. China is helping to push us together, but expect no complete alignment of views on China. And what we need is a grown-up playbook we're between Biden, Brussels, and Beijing to manage the rise of China and relations with China. So our conversation, I think Yanis, you're absolutely right, this conversation will continue. Thank you for making it very, very, uh, I have to say nitty gritty in a sense, really down to earth, nuts and bolts of this relationship, but also the wider picture, both at the same time, not very easy to do these days. The geopolitics of trade, as we all know, is becoming increasingly passionate and very, very important for our relations. So so thank you very much indeed to you, Tony, uh, to Sabine, to Nick, uh, Daniela and Yanis. And thank you also for this report, which I think will remain a very important uh, document for all of us in the coming four years and hopefully beyond the four years. So once again, thank you all of you for your questions as well. It's been a pleasure to moderate this discussion. Goodbye, everyone. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Bye. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you.